calendar up. So, calendar of what's coming up. Quiz tomorrow, including the virtual people watching at home. Um, it will be open note, so you don't have to zoom in because I don't need to watch you because you'll just thumb through your notes. Should be a, not a big deal. Should be kind of quick. Just a couple problems from 3.1 and 3.2. Um, just to kind of check up halfway and make sure we're where we need to be. Today we're going to do MVT and roles. Um, those are the two main topics. And roles is a subset of MVT, an easier subset of MVT. And so if you teach MVT first, it makes roles really easy because it's like, oh, this is just a little piece of it. But it's easier to teach roles because it's easier, and then you can kind of expand it to MVT. It doesn't matter which one we do. Um, we're going to do roles first because I think it's easy to understand, and then I think it's easy, relatively easy to make the jump from the specific case of roles to the <clears throat> generic case of mean value theorem. We'll see. Maybe you'll disagree when we get to the, the end of this. So before we introduce the main topic, the mean value theorem, let's start with a special case of this important theorem, um, Rolls theorem. Step one, place two points anywhere on the coordinate plane that have the same y values. Go ahead and do that now. You don't follow me. Put two points on that graph that have the same, put them probably far apart, like x direction, <clears throat> but they have to have the same y value, so the same height. So put them however high you want to as long as they have the same height. All right, well, from the few I can see, they look good. Step two, connect the two points with a continuous function, so no, you know, no squiggle back kind of thing. It's got to pass the vertical line test. Continuous, so no jumps, no asymptotes, and is also differentiable, so no, no cusps. So something normal looking, connect your two dots. Continuous, smooth, and no doubling back to make it not a function. Don't make it a straight line either, that'd be boring. I mean, it would still work, it just be kind of a boring situation. So there's my connecting the two. It doesn't matter what yours looks like as long as it meets those requirements where the, the y values at the ends are the same <clears throat> and you've connected it with continuous function that's differentiable. So no cost, nothing crazy. Conclusion. This is the conclusion of Rolls. Um, Roll was a French mathematician. Oh, it's, it's, if you need the history, it's right there. But he figured out that there must be at least one point on your function where you can draw a tangent line that is horizontal. So depending on what you drew in between there, there might be more than one, but there should be at least one spot between your endpoints that has a horizontal tangent line. So for mine, there's one spot. Mine has two spots. But you got to have at least one. You might have more than one. Uh, if you did a straight line, you'd have an infinite number of ones, right? They'd all be spots of horizontal tangent lines. So that'd be kind of boring. But pick, pick whatever spot or spots and maybe do a little horizontal tangent line there to illustrate what's going on. <clears throat> Well, what you just did was Rolle's theorem. Does anybody think they met the two criteria and yet didn't, don't have a place where they have a horizontal tangent line? Everybody found their horizontal tangent line or lines, plural. All right, so the, the more formal way to talk about Rolle's theorem, <clears throat> let f be a function that is continuous on the closed interval a b differentiable on the open interval so this is a little bit tricky to keep these two straight because the the open and closed interval thing we'll talk more about that in a minute so continuous on the closed interval 
differentiable on the open interval. If f of a equals f of b, so this is what you made happen, like the y values are the same, then there is at least one number between a and b where the derivative is 0. Let's see if I can <coughs> synthesize that down even further. Let's turn it into an if-then statement. If it's continuous on the closed interval, they both start with C. That's how I remember. Continuous goes with closed. Differentiable on the open interval. And f of a equals f of b. So the y values are the same. So if you meet those three criteria, then C, there's some place where the derivative is 0. Let's talk one more time about continuous versus differentiable. Another way to remember it, so the C thing is an easy way to remember it. Another way is that you, you can't really be differentiable at an endpoint. If you think about the limit definition of a derivative, so it, it has to be coming from the left and the right. But if you're at an endpoint, you can't, you can't get there from the other side. So you have to have an open interval for the derivative. So that's sort of the math explanation. If you want to go with just the, the C's go together explanation, that's fine too. The other thing about when we start to use theorems is you're going to have to state this stuff. So the AP test, if you want to use Rolle's theorem, you have to justify why you can use it. So you would say, <clears throat> well, it's continuous on A to B, it's differentiable on A to B, and the Y values are the same, therefore I know blah, blah, blah. So you have to know not just the conclusion, but you have to know the um, sort of prerequisites for using, you have to know the if part before you can use the then part. All right, well, let's, let's see what a problem might look like. Number one, determine if Rolle's theorem applies. <coughs> so that means, um, do we meet the criteria? Those three criteria. So we'll have to do that first. For this function on this interval, state thoroughly the reasons why or why not the theorem applies. And if the theorem does apply, OK, well, let's stop there. Let's see if the theorem applies. So continuous on the closed interval. So is that function continuous on negative 2 to 2? What do you think? What kind of function is that? Okay, I don't need to know the shape of it. I mean, that's close, probably. <clears throat> but generically speaking, um, yes, it's continuous because it's a polynomial. All polynomials are continuous. All polynomials are differentiable. Oh, I don't know that I need to say AB. I should probably say negative 2 to 2 to make it specific to this problem. All polynomials are continuous and differentiable. So we're good on the first two parts of the if statement. Now we need to check on f of 2 and f of negative 2, basically to see if they have the same y value. Doesn't matter where it is, but they got to be the same. So f of 2. 
2 to the 4th is 16 minus 8 is 8. F of negative 2. Uh, same thing, 16 minus 8 is 8. So F of 2 equals F of negative 2. So they have the same Y value. So we meet our three criteria for roles. It's continuous, it's differentiable, same Y value. That means that F prime somewhere equals 0 where C is on or in between A and B. second part of the, the problem statement here. If the theorem applies, find the value of C guaranteed by the theorem. So if the theorem does apply, yes it does, find C. So let's take a derivative and set it equal to zero and see where that happens. So F prime would be 4x cubed minus 4x We'll set that equal to zero and see where that happens. So I can factor out a 4x. That leaves x squared minus 1. So I get x equals 0, x equals 1, and x equals negative 1. And we had this issue before. We have to check and make sure that all of those answers we got are on the interval that we talked about. So we're guaranteed to get at least one answer by that's what Mr. Roll figured out. We happen to get three intervals or three answers, and they're all on negative two to two. We're not really going to do a graph of this thing. We're going to do one just to kind of show you. That's what the graph looks like. Again, I don't know that. I just plotted it before. And sure enough, so this would be one of those type problems where they might say, you know, use the use a graphing calculator to confirm what you know. Yeah, there's three places that have a horizontal tangent line. Okay, so that's Rolle's theorem. Three criteria: continuous on the closed, differentiable on the open, and the two y values are the same. If that happens. The conclusion is somewhere the derivative is zero. All right, mean value theorem. This is a more kind of a more general case. It's a similar thing to roles, but it's more general. It works for every, you don't have to have the, the y values don't have to be the same. If f is continuous on the closed, so again with the continuous on closed, differentiable on the open, then, okay, so continuous on the closed, Differentiable on the open. So that part, that part's the same as rolls. Rolls had the requirement that the y values are the same. We don't have that requirement here. The then here is this equation. Now 
that looks kind of crazy, but think about what that means. F prime, the derivative of F. What's the derivative tell us about the slope? So this is saying that the calculus slope, or the instantaneous rate of change, is equal to, what's that other side look like? I mean, it's a formula, but it should be a, something that looks familiar. Can you recognize that? That's like, that's like the algebra slope. Or the average slope. The average rate of change. On A to B. So the mean value theorem says that Somewhere, the instantaneous slope equals the average slope. Let's look at a picture. Maybe it'll help it make more sense. In the figure to the right, label the ordered pairs. Well, that x value is a. Um, what would the y value be if this function is f? f of a. Same thing on the other point, x value is b, so the y value is f of b. Part two, label a segment whose length is f of b minus f of a. So that's the y values. Um, I'm going to label it, that's the difference in the y value, so that'd be like right here. Right, that's the that's the change in y, f of b minus f of a, kind of hinting towards slope here. Label a segment whose length is b minus a. Well, that would be this length right there. Four, the quotient f of b minus f of a over b minus a is the blank of the segment joining the two points. So what does that describe about the segment joining the two points? That's the slope, the algebra slope, the average rate of change of the segment joining the two points, all well, the two points we're talking about, a comma f of a, b comma f of b. Draw in this segment. Okay, so I want to draw the segment from point a to point b. Or so there's the segment. And we know the slope of that segment, or we could know the slope of that segment. Five. F prime of C gives the what do you think goes in that blank? Slope. Calculus slope though. Slope of the line tangent to the curve. At the point, well, the x value is c, so at the point c, comma f of c. On the graph above, locate the c value that is guaranteed by the mean value theorem and draw a line tangent to the curve at x equals c. So somewhere on my graph, 
there should be a tangent line that is parallel that has the same slope as sort of the average rate of change, as that line segment. So somewhere, right, it's not down there, it's somewhere in the middle, there's a tangent line <coughs> whose slope is parallel to the average rate of change. So I'm going to say it's, I don't know, about right there. And there's a tangent line right there that's parallel to the average rate of change. Oh, I just answered uh, question seven there. The two lines drawn in the graph of f of x are what to each other? Parallel. They have the same slope. So in really slangy terms here, the MVT, the mean value theorem, is that the calculus slope somewhere is equal to the algebra slope. We could circle back to the what we said at the stop the top of this page. So calculus slope somewhere means f prime at c, we don't know c, but somewhere is equal to the algebra slope. That's just algebra one. So the mean value theorem is slope equals slope, but the calculus slope somewhere is equal to the overall algebra slope. Now, most of the MVT problems are part one, does MVT work? Meaning, check the two, is it continuous, is it differentiable? And then part two, if it does, if so, find C, find the somewhere. Well, where does that happen? MVT guarantees it happens, where does it happen? Number eight, question eight, blank eight. The conclusion of the mean value theorem can be restated. So we're, again, we're just trying to restate this three or four different ways so that it, it clicks in your brain somehow, somewhere. Two parallel lines, one through the point A, F of A, B, F of B. So through the, the endpoints of the range you're looking at. The other line is tangent to the curve at C, F of C. And again, your job is usually going to be find C, figure out what C is. And you'll do that by setting f prime equal to the algebra slope. So the calculus slope equals the algebra slope and figure out where that happens. Illustrating the mean value theorem. So we're going to do the same thing, but instead of like a generic picture, we've got an actual equation, some actual points to work with. Determine if the mean value theorem applies to this graph, which they've given us here, on the interval from 1 to 5. State thoroughly the reasons why or why not the theorem applies. Well, let's stop there. So that means we're checking the, the ifs of the equation. 
So continuous on the closed. And differentiable on the open. And we're looking from 1 to 5. So what happens outside of 1 to 5, we don't care about. So just looking from 1 to 5. So is it continuous on 1 to 5? Yes. Um, can you find or see a place where it's not continuous? Not between 1 and 5. 1 and 5 are good. But if we expand our window, where is it not continuous? At 0. We couldn't, we couldn't plug in 0. So if this interval included 0, we would, we would stop right here and say this doesn't work. So when we're talking about continuity, we only care about, and differentiability, we only care about the, in, the interval that it tells us about. So yeah, this thing is not continuous at 0, but we don't care about 0. We're only looking from 1 to 5. So we're good on 1 to 5. Differentiable, yeah, there's nothing crazy going on. There's no jumps. There's no missing points. Um, there's no cusp. So yes, it is continuous and differentiable on 1 to 5. So MVT applies. The mean value theorem applies. And I'll write it in words first this time. Calculus slope equals algebra slope. So f prime at c equals, oh, well, I need to find the algebra slope. So that would be f of 5 minus f of 1 over 5 minus 1. So f of 5, uh, I could pick it off the graph since they were kind enough to give us the graph, or I could get it from the equation, either one. 3 minus 5 over 5 is 2. f of 1, 3 minus 5 is negative 2. Again, from the equation or from the graph. They're not usually going to give you the graph. They're usually just going to give you the equation. <coughs> so f prime equals 2 minus negative 2 over 5 minus 1. So the the overall slope, or the average slope, the average rate of change the algebra slope equals 1. MVT guarantees that somewhere in between do it this way maybe somewhere in between 1 and 5 there's a tangent line that's parallel to the average slope and I don't know it looks like somewhere around 2 and we'll do the math to figure out but just by the picture it looks like 2 and a little bit I don't know the answer yet but it looks like somewhere around 2 So f prime would be, actually I'm going to rewrite f of x as 3 minus 5x to the negative 1 because I don't like taking derivatives of things in denominators. I'd have to use the quotient rule. So a little bit of algebra first. So bring the negative 1 down, 5x to the negative 2. All right, calculus slope equals algebra slope. Calculus slope is 
5 over x squared. Algebra slope is 1. So the, these MVT problems involve a whole lot of math. You got to do some calculus. You got to do some algebra. And that's just to set up the equation. Now we'll solve the equation. So 5 equals x squared. x equals plus or minus the square root of 5. Square root of 5 is 2 and a little bit. That matches what we thought earlier, somewhere, somewhere a little bit bigger than 2. There's a tangent line. Um, I got two answers here, and I only found one point on the graph. What's what's going on? I can't have the negative one. So the slope at negative square root of five is apparently equal to one too, but that's not that's not in my range, so I don't care about that one. So negative square root of 5 is not on or in 1, 5. So I have to throw him out. So my answer is x equals square root of 5. And that's kind of nice on this one because they gave us a picture so it, it matches. Most of the time you don't have a picture. So you're kind of flying blind and trusting your algebra and calculus. If you have a graphing calculator, then you could graph them and, and kind of see how it all looks and works. But a lot of times you don't have a calculator. Number three. Find the equation of the tangent line to the graph of this thing on the interval 0 pi at the point which is the solution to the mean value theorem. Confirm using your graphing calculator. Okay, so this one's worded a little bit differently, but we're still using the mean value theorem. So that means that calculus slope equals algebra slope. Calculus slope somewhere equals algebra slope for the whole thing. I don't want to write somewhere. Calculus slope at C equals algebra slope on this one from 0 to pi. So again, I take a derivative to find the calculus slope. I do old school algebra 1 to find the algebra slope. I set them equal to each other and figure out where that happens. So I need to find f of 0 and f of pi to do my algebra slope. f of 0 would be 2 times 0 plus sine of 0 plus 1. So all that's 1. f of pi, 2 pi plus sine pi plus 1. Sine of pi. Sine of pi is 0. 2 pi plus 1. So my algebra slope is 2 pi plus 1 minus 1 over pi minus 0. Right? This is just old school algebra 1. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Which turns out to be kind of nice. Sometimes they rig these problems to work out for us. So the overall slope, the algebra slope, the average rate of change from 0 to pi is 2. That's the algebra part of the problem. I don't want to say half of the problem, but it's really not even half. The calculus part of the problem is I need to figure out what f prime is and set it equal to 2. 2 plus cosine of x. So the algebra slope is 2. The calculus slope is 2 plus cosine of x. And now my job is to figure out, well, where does that happen? So sort of the final third of the problem is solve the equation you get. 
So cosine of x equals 0. Let's see. Cosine is 0 uh, there and there. So that would be pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Except that I can't. What's wrong with that answer? Yeah, the, the 3 pi over 2 is not in the interval, so I can throw that one out. It's got to be between 0 and pi. Let's reread the question to make sure that we've answered everything. Find the equation of the tangent line. Oh, we've not done that. We found where it happened, and we know the slope, but I haven't done the tangent line yet. So the slope is 2, because the algebra slope and the calculus slope are 2. And the x value is pi over 2. I don't know the y value, though. So what can I do to find the y value? Plug it in. Am I going to plug it into f prime or to f? one. If I want the y value of the point on the function, do I want to plug it into f or do I want to plug it into f prime? F. F prime will tell me the slope. In fact, it better tell me 2 because that's what we figured out the slope was. But I want to plug it into the original to find that y value. So let's see, that would be pi plus sine of pi over 2 is 1. That's a lovely uh, point. So the point is pi over 2 comma pi plus 2. So if I go back, uh, I'm kind of out of room. Oh, this number four really applies to the next page, so I can do my I can do my tangent line right here. So y minus pi plus two, and I can leave it like that. Like I don't need to simplify, distribute, move things around. Like just leave it. Equals the slope times x minus pi over two. Wow, that problem had a whole lot of stuff in it had to find an algebra slope and a calculus slope. Mean value theorem says they're equal to each other. We found out where that happened, and then we had to write a tangent line at that point. A lot of stuff going on on that, that problem. But back up, mean value theorem is algebra slope overall equals calculus slope somewhere. And your job is to find the somewhere. This next section is a little bit easier because we don't have to do anything. They, they kind of give away the, the ball game here. Explain why we cannot apply the mean value theorem. So the only two conditions we have is continuous on the interval, on the closed interval, and differentiable on the open interval. So something's gone wrong here on these problems. Ooh, we, we had one kind of like this yesterday. Absolute value. What's, what's the key point at an absolute value? There's a cusp. Where's the cusp for this one? So, and 3 is in the, the interval, so this thing is not differentiable. at x equals 3. Now, if it had been differentiable somewhere outside the interval, we'd be okay. But since our, 
problem child is in the interval, um, we can't use mean value theorem. We like it when this happens because then the problem is over. Like I don't have to do anything else. What about B? What's going on at, for B? Asymptote. Where is there an asymptote? So no MVT because it's not continuous. If we want to really get make it match what we're looking for. I guess you could say it's not differentiable there either. You could say either one. Because if it's not continuous, it's definitely not differentiable. C is a little bit harder. I don't really know what that looks like, maybe, without a calculator. But if you take the derivative, 2 thirds x to the negative 1 third, So negative sends it to the bottom. So what's the, uh, what's the problem with that one? Uh, it's not really the square root or the cube root. That's OK. What's going on at x equals 0? What's undefined? Be more specific. You're right. Something's undefined. The slope's undefined. The derivative's undefined. h prime is undefined. Any of those words. So that means it's not differentiable, which means we can't use the MVT. Again, we like those problems because once you figure out what the error is, you're done. There's, the MVT doesn't apply, so you can't keep going. Um, we're going to pass on the real-world application, although it's, it's just kind of interesting because uh, basically the if a cop clocks you, if you've traveled, um, let's see, if you traveled five miles in four minutes, just summarize this problem. So he, he doesn't have a radar gun, but um, sometimes you may have seen where it says uh, speed monitored by aircraft or whatever, and so they have marks on the ground. And they know if you traveled five miles in four minutes, that's 75 miles per hour. And so even if the cop never gets your instantaneous rate of change at 75 miles per hour. He knows your average rate of change was 75 miles per hour. And so you can't say, well, I was never going 75. The, the cop is going to say, well, listen here, I know the mean value theorem. And that means that my average rate of change somewhere equals the instantaneous rate of change. So somewhere in between there, you were going 75. <coughs> I don't think cops go through all of that, but that's why they're able to pull you over if they know you got from here to here in too short a time, means your average speed was greater than the speed limit, which means somewhere your speed was greater than the speed limit. All right, the assignment is page 174, 9 through 21 odd, and 35 to 45 odd. quiz tomorrow, but we will go over the assignment before we take the quiz, right? Because the quiz includes some of this stuff. So try some. You may get stuck on some. That's okay. Tomorrow's a block day, or Thursday, I guess, for you guys. Um, just make, so don't worry about the quiz, plus it's open note. And again, we'll, we'll go over homework before we take the quiz tomorrow. <coughs>